Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've all had time to recharge your coffees and teas and, uh, and have enjoyed this morning so far. I think it's, uh, as Mark said before the break, it's been a fantastic start to the conference. Um, and I've been really looking forward to this panel um, and when we talked about the, the subject matter, the global picture, we were saying what, what an exciting community it came up again um, as being a, a key attribute of the accessibility movement. And, um, you know, across the globe we have people doing amazing things and so many of them have joined us at TechShare Pro. I was having a look earlier and I think I counted 43 countries where we've had people signed up to the conference and um, our panel today we have people from all around uh, the world joining in to talk about our common goals and also the different challenges that we're encountering and perhaps how we work even more closely together to resolve those challenges. So I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Uh, we have Irene from en Enable, we have Mikhail from Access Israel, Susanna from the I I I AAP, always I have to put my teeth back in for that one, <laughs> and Shilpi from Barrier Break, and Sarah from Sync Leadership. So welcome to all of the panel. Thank you so much for being here today. And I know some of you have traveled quite a long way and others are beaming in from, uh, from their home countries. So um, I guess it would be great, first of all, to just hear from all of you about your role, the work you're doing in accessibility, and perhaps uh, some of the um, key challenges that you're experiencing in your work um, would be fantastic. So perhaps we could kick off with Irene. Uh, I know you're no stranger to organising events like this. Uh, perhaps you'd like to fill us in on, on some of the things that you've been doing. Okay. So thanks for having me. It's always uh, a pleasure to work with partners. I think I've worked with most of these people here. Um, definitely Africa is my home. I come from Kenya. So, and having lived in the States, um, I learned, I've learned a lot about accessibility and collaborations. So really what our organization does is two things. One, we train blind youth how to use uh, technology. So we make sure that their digital skills are advanced so that they're able to participate in the global economy. So on a, on a daily basis, we have about a thousand blind students participating in our programs. So that's one. The other piece that we focus on is on ensuring that we promote digital accessibility across Africa. So we host the Inclusive Africa Conference, which has been an amazing experience. And the reason it's been amazing is because of the collaborations and the support received, even from TechShare and Access Israel and other partners. And um, this year, what is beautiful about Inclusive Africa is that there's a new breed of young people with disabilities who have embraced technology and they wanna learn how can we make sure the whole continent <coughs> can, can make sure that our, um, most of these digital products that we are using are accessible. And I have to say that they're using uh, technology in a very different way. For most of us in the West, when technology, you have a laptop, you have a, you have a phone, you have an iPad. For them, their phone is their everything. So they maximize on the phone. So you can imagine the solutions that we need. We need to make sure that the mobile phone has the most accessible applications and services and products that we can provide. So there's a lot to learn from these young people. But one thing Inclusive Africa is doing is making sure that we are engaging countries across the continent. So a good example, we had 14 African countries participating in terms of they were hosting watch parties to make sure that we are all having the same conversation. So I'm inviting everyone next year, May 30th and 31st, we are hosting the next Inclusive Africa conference in Nairobi um, wow. to at least digit uh, discuss digital inclusion in Africa. And the last point is there's more than 1.4 billion people in Africa. And digital accessibility is a very new topic. You can imagine 15% of that population are people living with disabilities or even the elderly 
people living in low bandwidth areas. So what I'm saying is there's a great opportunity for all of us to come together, collaborate, and make sure that uh, Africa is a more inclusive continent. Thank you. Oh, Irene, that sounds like some amazing work going on and really excited about Inclusion Africa next year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, going in a little bit more to what you were saying, the I guess you have a, a situation in Africa, again, where perhaps there are people who would really benefit from digital, but that link hasn't been made. It's still, you know, there's a, there's a certain amount of, as we have experienced in the UK, I was talking about earlier, that education so that people understand the power of digital and the fact that there mm. are inbuilt in mobile phones many many features that can allow people to access when perhaps mm -hmm. they weren't aware so uh, yeah the work that you're doing um with the blind students for instance i'm sure that then starts to flow mm -hmm. out to friends and family mm -hmm. and people catching on to to what can be achieved yes yeah. and what would you say the biggest challenges are uh, in the work that you're doing so on the first piece for digital skills, I think that um, first I'm very excited that now the focus is on Africa because I've done this for almost 15 years and half the time I was talking to myself or our organization <laughs> had no partners. But now pe uh, people are more interested, organizations and companies are now interested. And part of the challenges that we faced is that you could find a global company mm -hmm talks about accessibility, implements accessibility strategies in the West, but when you come to their African offices, the global strategy doesn't trickle down to the local offices. <clears throat> so my hope is that more companies can start implementing accessibility within their local offices. That's one, so that's a huge challenge. The other one is that uh, there's a gap where I think um, the importance of digital accessibility skills, I mean digital skills for people with disabilities. I think if we're going to invest in employment, which is what most companies are doing now, coming up with employment programs, we need to look at the pipeline and see the education. Where are people with disabilities? Because if we have not made investments in that space for generations, how are we expecting people with disabilities to qualify for the amazing <coughs> employment programs that we're creating? So my hope is that as we create employment programs, we can take steps back and invest in education. Definitely. And I think um, teaching and learning staff are a huge key there where there's an awful lot of human support that's provided throughout people's education. And then when they go into the workplace, it's, it's quite a sort of a, a sharp um, falling away of that. And, and to have those digital solutions in place sooner is definitely going to make those employment programmes much more successful. Great. OK. So... Off to Israel now. <laughs> Mikhail, tell us all about Access Israel and, and the work that you do and perhaps the general um, state of the nation in terms of digital accessibility in Israel. First of all, I'll open and say um, May 30th and 31st, I'm going to be there. Um, it's definitely a place, uh, a place to be. And, and one of the things that I love uh, uh, about this global community is to see how we're developing and how uh, you know things are happening, Th things are moving, and uh, I'm happy to have friends that are doing it so well. Mm. Um, Access Israel is the leading organization for accessibility in Israel. We were established 23 years ago in an Gosh. Israel that was not accessible at all. We are latecomers. You know, we're talking UK, USA, that are decades into accessibility. Uh, in Israel, we are latecomers, but we ran. Um, um, the word accessibility was not in use at the time. Uh, Yuval Wagner, who established Access Israel, is basically um, uh, the son of a person in a wheelchair. He, he, he experienced lack of accessibility as a child and then became himself a person with disability and experienced it from the other side. And when you know, it reached a point that he couldn't stand it anymore, he wrote a letter to the president of Israel and said, what else do I need to do? to gain respect and, and, and ability to live my life as everybody else. And that president, as a Weizmann, basically said three things. One, I apologize that we didn't do anything. Two, stop complaining, start doing, establish <laughs> access as well. That was as a Weizmann. And three, he gave a timeline. Six months, 
in the uh, president's residence, we're going to launch it. We started with a digital project, which was a website. Again, we're talking about a country that has no laws about accessibility. But the president and, and Access Israel, basically, we started with saying, okay, the websites are now a hot thing. Let's make sure that websites will have information about accessibility. Let us, don't tell us it will be okay. Come, come, we'll, we'll find a way to include you. Give us the opportunity uh, to know in advance. That was how we started. And then when we started that, people started to say, what is accessibility? So awareness building was something very strong that Access Israel did. And then when they said, ah, now we understand, how can we do it? Implementation came in. And through implementation, it's uh, training, and it's uh, uh, consulting, and it's how to take an organization, small or large, and create and make it an accessible one. And then technology and legislation. And I can tell you that today, um, um, Israel has very elaborate laws on accessibility, especially service accessibility. Um, Israel, I think, is the only country in the world where, by law, every service provider has to go through accessible training, accessibility services training, every single year, and at least once uh, to do it in an experiential way. We are known, Access Israel is known as the crazy Israelis, going around the world doing experiential things, taking this, you know, maybe not so sexy and not, uh, you know, people don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, uh, I wonder how a blind person feels, and we have them stand in line to try it. And the legislator saw that and basically adopted it into legislation. So today it's a, it's a mandatory thing in Israel. Um, uh, in Israel we have coordinators, accessibility coordinators or directors in every company that provides services to the public and have more than 25 employees. Uh, all websites have to be accessible if they provide services to the public, etc., etc. There are a lot of really advanced things. I do um, uh, say, though, that, um, you know, I'm being realistic. The full half glass is very full. I mean, a lot of amazing things. But we still have the empty half glass. Job security is fine with me. I know I'll have a long, a long time to continue doing what we're doing because we still have to, to convince uh, uh, people. Um, and basically, we did this internally in Israel for many, many years. And then about nine years ago, I went out to see the first conference, you know, internet conference and I came to learn I didn't really think we have a lot to share we weren't aware of what's going on around the world and then I saw two things one that we can learn from everyone developing country developed countries it doesn't really matter because accessibility and disability is something that we all share and the great thing for me is we found out that we can also share ourselves we have a lot of things to share with uh, with others and then this international work began and uh, today I can say that this for me it's one of my uh, biggest focuses and uh, and I'm having fun while I'm doing it with great friends all around uh, and uh, and the idea is really to create a place where you don't have to reinvent the wheel and you can, can build on successes that others have and maybe make it better for you for your country and for others so this is a, a great uh, uh, thing that is happening. Really exciting, and I wasn't aware of the extent to which I, I guess it's um, it's it seems that accessibility has been baked in and, and become quite structural in Israel, and that makes an enormous difference, yeah. doesn't it? To have mm -hmm. those structures and to point to that take away the excuses as well. Things like regular mandatory training, things like having people with a specific role that relates to accessibility, Absolutely. removes that sense of it's too difficult, we don't know how to, we don't have time. Mm -hmm. um, and from a legislative perspective, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. how, um, how is that managed? Would you say there's a strong uh, enforcement or is it just something that, you know, people comply with a bit like a, the, the, the dreaded uh, GDPR in, in the UK. So I, I'll tell you, well, the law in Israel, the, the equality law has teeth. Yes. It's not just a law that states, oh, it will be nice, please do this. Uh, we're not coming from a begging point of view. Mm -hmm. So the law has teeth. There's the uh, commissioner's office in Israel, in the uh, Justice Ministry of Justice, that do a great, great job. They have the power to also enforce they maybe lack enough funds to have enough enforcers sure. to do it. So it's, again, as I said, half uh, full, half empty glass. 
Um, but but it's not just uh, you see the change and you see the enforcement and you see uh, you know the difference happening uh, 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 over the years. But again, as I said, this is something I personally believe that it's something that you have to start from the people themselves. You have to start from you know changing the DNA of society. And and you know Whitney Houston sang, I believe the children are our future. To really start, you know, you're you're going to the to the young people and giving them the the tools. I think that to really come and and provide the atmosphere, provide the the, the setting, to really change our DNA. So in ten years, the next uh, programmers, the next developers, the next uh, CEOs will have it in them naturally. So. That's a collaborative effort. Definitely. I think the hearts and minds is, is much more powerful than enforcement, isn't it? But having those frameworks there can sometimes instigate those conversations with people who perhaps haven't quite caught on to these things um, as yet. So uh, how about going to your half-empty part of the glass? What, what, what are the big challenges and how could the global community possibly help? First of all, um, I think that when we're talking about challenges, um, budget is definitely uh, a challenge that we have to address. Yeah. Um, to break that, uh, um, you know, we, we preach to preachers. We all know the largest minority in the yeah. world. We know all this, but we have to come uh, to the um, uh, CEOs, to the companies, to the developers, and, 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 and make sure that this is a known thing. I don't believe people are bad. I don't believe people are waking up in the morning and say, we want to exclude them. We have to make sure that they know it, that they understand also the financial um, uh, benefits yeah. and the social uh, benefits, SDGs, uh, et cetera, that we have to uh, take into account. Um, uh, I think also that we have this, uh, you know, if we're relating to technology, one of the, the uh, biggest challenges is the fact that the tech era is constantly changing, constantly, yeah. you know, you, you, you get something right and now it's changed and advanced and we have to make sure that, uh, you know, we call it intuitive accessibility. Yeah. We have to make sure that whatever is developed is developed in a way that you don't have to now go back, you know, think about the elderly, think about people with disabilities that are used to, you know, doing it in a certain way. Let's make sure that the upgrades, let's make sure that all the, the, the changes that occur, occur in a way that it's intuitive to adapt to it and, 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 and you know, embrace the change. And so much of that um, relies upon people living with disabilities being really embedded in tech development, doesn't it? Yeah, because yeah. then you have those wider conversations and, and that curiosity to identify every possible barrier and uh, design it out when we're creating yeah. and new I think technology. that since the, the, the subject of today's uh, panel is the global community I think another challenge that we have to put on the table is let's make sure we're not reinventing wheels let's make sure we're, we're, we're creating that atmosphere of sharing and 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 uh, exchanging and learning from each other in a way that keeps the individuality but makes sure we're moving forward together and not putting you know, uh, stones or sticks or whatever in the, in the wheels, whatever the saying is in English. So I yeah. think that's an important thing also. Absolutely. We're working together, aren't we, rather than Absolutely. competing against one another. Wow. Well, that's been, uh, I've learned a lot there about <laughs> Africa and Israel. So let's uh, go zooming off to India, shall we? Shilpi, welcome. How are you? Very well, Amy. How are you? Really good, thank you. Really good. So, uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about the situation for accessibility in India? And I know when we caught up um, to plan this session, we were talking a little bit about uh, the activity um, coming out of India, supporting other parts of the globe, and then the domestic situation and, and how, how that sort of fits together? Well, that's actually the perfect, you know, uh, point for me to start talking about that, I think. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I think, you know, from an India perspective, uh, very similar to Access Israel, uh, you know, Barrier Break was founded about 20 years back. Uh, we basically started with 
uh, the requirement that, uh, you know, I, one of my bosses was somebody with a disability. And I had no clue that he had a disability for two years that I worked with him. And that's really why I started focusing on accessibility and inclusion, because I realized that in a country as big as India, I couldn't necessarily change physical infrastructure, but I knew I could change digital infrastructure because to Mikhail's point, it's forever changing. Uh, technology is always changing, websites are always changing. And I thought that that was an opportunity where that we, you know, we could build inclusion differently. So very similar to Access as well, we started off with, you know, lobbying and advocacy within India. We helped write some of, you know, some amazing laws and guidelines that were required, not only for India, but also globally. So I think people like Susanna, me, we actually went around the globe with G3ICT, helping countries draft some of these laws and guidelines. And it was quite, uh, it was truly a global, global uh, initiative, I think, for all of us to see UNCRPD come alive. But I think for me personally and for Barrier Break, it was always about India being that hotbed of technology. And if there was so much technology that was coming out of India, we ensure it could be accessible. But let me tell you, at the initial first start of 20 years, I did a very bad job of doing it because most of the Indian IT industry said, oh no, we really don't need to look at accessibility. When we get sued, we'll talk about it then. Right? And I think we've all heard this statement in our own worlds at some point or the other. Uh, fast forward to today. Uh, you know, uh, today you have more accessibility professionals in India than you have sometimes in some of the other countries. Um, and we see all of these IT companies picking up the school of people. We ourselves at Barrier Break totally believe that accessibility is about skill, right? And that's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen one website at a time, one app at a time, but we have so many websites and so many apps out there that it is about doing it at scale. So, you know, just to give a very small perspective, uh, if the entire Indian IT industry took accessibility seriously, we would have a lot of accessible solutions out there. But to Mikhail's point and Irene's point, we have a lot of gap in the skills of people. Right? And it starts with basic digital understanding that you see a huge gap in. But yes, we have customers asking for accessibility today. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, five years back, most accessibility work that was done by us at Barrier Break was just a project at a time. Somebody gave you a website to audit and they actually never went back and fixed it. You don't even know where those issues went in, in the world and they kind of disappeared into their bug tracking systems. And today you can see that a lot of those organizations are taking accessibility seriously. It's now something that's being monitored and accounted for. Now the question is, what we are seeing happen for those companies, how can we replicate that for everybody else, right from the startups to the larger organizations who are taking this seriously for whatever that reason might be. It might be the carrot or it might be the stick. But I think what's really critical in this whole space is how do we build skill set? And how do we bring in people beyond our world, right? So very break, what we do is we hire a lot of freshers. And we find that training them into being accessibility professionals is a fabulous way because they don't have to unlearn something that they've done for 10 years. We start them off with the right kind of foundation, which also leads me into that, you know, we have the IAAP India chapter, right? And uh, we do some great work in the global space with all of us coming together, AbilityNet and IAAP. India uh, and IAAP UK, we host the network and learn session, right? We do that because we truly believe we are a global you know, community and uh, we can support each other's countries with cross learning and, you know, helping people understand professionalism within accessibility. It has to go from being that one off project that somebody gave you and, you know, that checklist that you had to just tick in the box to coming down to something that was systemic and cross. Right? And I'm hoping that over the next five years, we see just, you know, we see that happen. So I also believe that a lot of accessibility has come to India because of the global implementation. Mm -hmm. Right. So something as simple as captioning or audio description has become ubiquitous to a lot of the platforms that they are for entertainment. Uh, it was not created for India. 
but it has come to India. And I think, Irene, will see the same thing in Africa happen. I'm sure it's happening in all parts of the world that, you know, when technology is just everywhere and it's the same technology, it just helps, you know, support so many different people. So we believe at Barrier Break that, you know, while we can provide services out of India, which is what we do from an accessibility audit perspective, uh, maturity models, consulting perspective, that is, you know, a, a way to build inflection in the rest of the world. And that's how we can contribute back to accessibility worldwide. But going from there to the India story, right? Uh, we used to run TechShare in India. 2008 to 2016, we ran eight editions of TechShare India, right? So I totally am so amazed to be at this forum right now because it's TechShare Pro. Um, but having said that, we have some amazing laws and policies that are written out. I think the gap for us is implementation. Unlike Access Israel and Israel in particular, we don't have teeth in a lot of our policies. Um, so there is no accountability that people are necessarily <clears throat> held to, though the law requires that they focus on this. So I think it's, it's time that, you know, and we say this in India, and Irene mentioned this, we find our counterparts doing this, the right thing by the West, but we don't see them doing the same thing in India. And I think it's time to push global organizations to first look at countries like Africa and India um, opportunities, mm -hmm. and uh, then be the leaders to help, you know, to have other Indian organizations follow them rather than anything else. So I think that's a little about us. That's really interesting. You made some really um, key points. I can't hear, oh, can't hear me. Again. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes. sorry. I need to stay still. I'm obviously uh, knocking my microphone. No, um, I was going to say it's a really interesting point that you made about how um, how the approach to accessibility is evolving, both with your customer base going from that one-off project to a, an ongoing program, um, and then also how things are evolving in India. And we always talk about, you mentioned maturity models, and we always talk about the, uh, the, the process being like um, an acorn growing into an oak tree, you know. It never really ends and everyone has potential, every organisation has potential to be accessible and inclusive, but we're all at different stages. And I think being able to break that down and reflect, um, and, and I'd say across this panel, I'm sure each country or region has, um, you know, has some areas that are inching ahead of each other, but when we all come together collectively, we can really assist each other and, and move that forward. But again, going back to what you were saying, Shilpi, about wanting to um, accelerate things for the domestic marketplace, again, I think it's that whole sense of uh, walking the walk in your region to be able to really be that that kind of um, best pr practice example as well as having those fantastic skills. Um, and another challenge that I think crops up a lot in different regions and certainly in Europe is skills, uh, the, the sort of lack of skills and so having professionals um, all around the globe and, and making sure that people can, can pull together to achieve, because you're absolutely right, it's a huge amount of work that's available. I don't think anyone's going to be running out of work in the near future. So really, really interesting. And Susanna, the uh, IAAP came up a couple of times, the International Association for Accessibility Professionals. So could you tell us about that organisation for anyone who's not heard of you? Yes, so I wear many hats and um, today I'm here <laughs> as, as the uh, G3ICT and IWP representative to the EU. That's a very fancy title, but mm -hmm. I'm also the, the chief research and innovation officer at a small accessibility company called Funka with similar roots as, as all others. So I'm, I'm one of the dinosaurs being around for more than 20 years in this industry, but it's really interesting to, uh, to be here also representing IWP because I think everything that has been said um, is kind of 
um, building up to the same thing. We need to share knowledge, we need to not, not reinvent the wheel and so on. And what IWP is doing is trying to get the industry or the whole community get together and, and make sure that everyone who claims to be an accessibility expert really knows what they are talking about. Mm. Because that has been a big problem when I look back. Uh, anyone could just raise their hand and say, I'm an accessibility expert. And as you probably all know, if you have more than two accessibility, more than one accessibility expert in the room, they usually don't agree <laughs> uh, on how to interpret standards and, and all of that. So, so IWP is a global organization. We have members in 97, 98. I just got the first uh, member in Iceland, so that's really exciting. Cool. But we, we, we really reach uh, globally, and we have we organize both individual members and organizations. So uh, even if the membership counts to 5,000 something, that is really low because some of the organizations have many uh, um, staff, of course, in their organization. So uh, actually, we are we are kind of organizing uh, many more. And the idea is to certify professionals so that the individual can or the company can show proof of evidence that we know what we are talking about, and also to make sure that procurers and recruiters who want to make sure that whoever they get hired or, or recruit uh, to uh, <coughs> or suppliers that that are providing them with accessibility expertise. Uh, comply to the same standards and, and, and offer the same level of, of expertise in their services. So we work at a global uh, stage, but we also have local chapters like the one in, in, in India and the one in UK. Um, we also have a Nordic chapter covering uh, the Nordic countries and we have a Dach chapter covering uh, German speaking parts of, of Germany, of course, uh, Switzerland and Austria and so on. And we are building other chapters also around the globe, South America, Middle East and so on. But um, but we also do EU kind of EU coverage, so EU umbrella. We call it the EU initiative. So that is what I'm leading because now, as we have harmonised standards, we have the same minimum requirements in all EU countries, and we have the same laws. And it's a new directive coming up also in 2025. So that's why we think that all our members, even if you are in a, in a if you're based or making business in an EU country that is not uh, that doesn't have a chapter yet because some of the countries are really small. Uh, then we can still support you in a very good way with this EU uh, level initiative where we, we do events and webinars and newsletters and policy up updates and all sorts of things. And we actually have a drop-in session here at TechShare Pro tomorrow at um, 1.30, I think. Now, I'm mixing up the GMT and CET, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a lunch and learn, so midday, and it's free of charge, and it's run by my dear colleague Alberto, who is uh, coordinating the EU um, work we do. So there you can hear from the members. I'm, of course, telling you that IWP is fantastic, but there you can hear from the actual members who say the truth about what, it's, what it means to be part of, of this community. I mean, certainly at AbilityNet, our team take advantage of your certification, the CPAC, and, and the WAS uh, certification. And it, it's, it's a tough, um, it's rigorous, it's really it excellent. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I I remember when they were being put together, and that was quite a global affair, wasn't it? Yes. You had mm -hmm. the great and the good from all around the world. And the bad and the ugly. <laughs> well, everyone needs to be included. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's been an excellent piece of work. And again, I think um, you see people coming together to prepare for, for the uh, certification as well, which again leads to relationships being built and best practice being shared. So I think it's an amazing organization. And how about... Um, so it sounds like it's growing rapidly and you've certainly got huge reach into different countries. What are the challenges for IAAP and how could other global um, players, if you like, help drive things forward? So I'm really proud and amazed that we have been growing still during the pandemic. I thought accessibility as such and also membership in an organization would be one of the first things that got off the mm. table when you when kind of budgets are, are uh, sharp and so on. But but we have been growing also during the pandemic. So that's very, very kind of rewarding and, 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 and nice. But I think the challenge is language. Yes. So and that is not only for IWP, but I think for everyone. Like I've been working with Irene in, in, in Kenya. In Kenya, the language is not a problem, but in many other countries in Africa, it, it could be a barrier that the standards are in, in English and so on. And it's the same in Europe, of course, that we have uh, 24 uh, official languages in the 27 countries, and, mm. and the level of English differs a lot between different countries. Uh, and we, I think, we need to make sure that there is 
uh, not only IWP material and certification and exams and everything, but also standards, legislation, all the support material that exists in, in English, some in Spanish, some in, in French and so on. Uh, Hebrew, I don't know, but, but I'm just having the, 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 the European perspective here. We know that we need to work with, with the translations because that is really to get everyone on board and to make sure that we spread this knowledge and the enormous uh, resources that we need in Europe like now. I mean, the current legislation only, only covers public sector. But public sector is still huge. Mm. <laughs> uh, we don't, every member state claims that they have a problem with they don't have enough experts every yeah. member state and in a couple of years we will cover also part of the par private sector this is really the place so i tell all of you listening here if you want a secure job forever <laughs> and something that is fun and nice and get you to go to kenya to see the elephants then <laughs> then you should really become an accessibility expert because that is really what we need we need much more boots on the ground everywhere but translation is our biggest challenge it takes time and it's very difficult also the certifications and the body of knowledge and so on. That is not something we invent internally. That is, that is created in a very rigorous um, internationally renowned certification scheme thing so that the people doing the body of knowledge, they cannot uh, do the, uh, the questions for the exam and they cannot do so it's. People ask me sometimes, can't you help me a little bit with this exam? And I said, yeah, I kind of, I'm in the certification committee and I work with this, but I really can't help you because it's so, it's so cleverly done. So even if I have been <laughs> creating some of the questions, I can't help you with the exam. Yeah. That's really true. That's amazing. I didn't know certification before I started working with, with the IWP certification. It's, really, it's a really cool thing. And just to keep people on top of their skills, that is, I think that is something that I will, when I retire, I will look back on and say that was, we made something good because now we see an increase. I'm, Europe is kind of my, my speciality, so I, but we do see more procurers um, referring to the IWP certification or something similar, but there is something, nothing similar. And, uh, and also people in recruitment advertising, we see that people uh, refer to the certification. So I think in a couple of years time, we will see many more certified uh, professionals and that will, increase people's salaries <laughs> and also make this more into a real profession that it needs to be if, if we ever going to make the world more inclusive for, for people with disabilities. And I do think we're seeing that slight step change like it used to be that if somebody you know if you said you worked in accessibility you really had to go back to basics to explain what that was whereas it does feel that it's becoming much more understood and appreciated and certainly you know from our perspective where we do recruit a lot of people straight out of university there's a desire and a value of that career path that perhaps didn't exist before people were coming along to us who were trained as you know computer programmers and say oh okay we'll give that a try whereas now it, it's it's people's on their wish list to develop that career it is true but still the vast majority of universities at least in europe do not teach in accessibility maybe they have a small course of a couple of weeks but people we are still uh, getting people out of designers, UXers, developers, all of them, all web professionals that get out, a vast majority of the ones that, that get out of the university, they, they still don't know the basics of accessibility. That needs to change. Mm -hmm. oh, well, it's so inefficient because yeah. they're having to unpick yeah. a lot of the things that they've learned. Which I is remember. good for, I mean, I, was being, I mean, if I wear my Funka hat, that's br brilliant because we can keep on training them forever. But that doesn't scale. No. It just won't scale. So no. we, need, we need to teach, make sure that it gets into the curriculum in, in all university studies, I think. It's starting to move, isn't it? But yeah, no, I but was talking still, to someone recently who said, it was an optional module in their third year. Yeah, <laughs> not much well, use I, then. <laughs> I still remember when I did a guest uh, uh, lecture at the, I won't say that, but a technical university, and I had like 37 uh, girls and one boy. And I asked, so why are you here? That's interesting. And he said, oh, here, here's where, the, where all the chicks are. So that's, you know, <laughs> and that was his one, only one, reason. One reason. Yeah, that's one reason to go into, yeah. So, yeah. Mm. But that Amazing. was a couple of years ago, yeah. And is there anywhere in Europe, any countries that, because, uh, you know, if you look at diversity of, you know, small countries all clustered together, but with, you know, with things in common and differences, is there anywhere that stands out that you say, this is a country to watch or, or a country that's struggling to get traction? Oh, well, hmm. 
so very broad. I don't want to uh, kind of pinpoint, <laughs> but we have a slight problem in France because they still haven't reported on the directive. So that's mm -hmm. kind of a policy issue there. So we don't know really what's happening in France. If I'm we kind of the commission um, and uh, <laughs> and then we have countries that are struggling still with the, with their economy. Of course, they also struggle with this. So I think that is uh, obvious. But when when we were involved in the review of the Web Accessibility Directive, the most encouraging thing for me was that every member state, small Malta, tiny Malta and Luxembourg, up to German, big Germany and Italy, they all said the same thing. The public sector bodies that are monitored from the kind of the monitoring agency, hey, we are the police, we're going to monitor you, they were happy about being monitored. They thought it was a good thing, it's a, it's a for free consultancy and now we know what we need to do and they wanted to, to make it better. And that was across the member states. Mm. And I've been working with this legislation for so long and in the negotiation process everyone said, this is impossible, it's too much, we can't do this, there's no money, everyone said no to everything. It was such a big pushback, <laughs> so I was like, oh, I'm not doing the review of this, how is this going to work? And they're so positive. So that is that part of enforcement, that is not policing, it's more the fire brigade, we're here to help Boundaries you. Boundaries Yes, as well, and also in the, the combination framework. with the self-declaration that the public sector bodies do, that means that they need to know the level of accessibility and, of course, my favorite part, the feedback mechanism, so that the end users, actually the, the bottom-up approach, that they uh, get, um, provide feedback to the, to the public sector body. Those three pillars, when that works well, that's a brilliant way of, of making enforcement. And I really think I see so much interest from around the globe and I hope more, more countries and regions will look into this because we see already it's really working. That doesn't, to copy what you're saying, we are, we are not finished yet, everything mm. is not perfect, I know that, but I see an enormous progress that I didn't think I would see in my lifetime. Yeah, because people have been given a format and an yes. expectation, whereas yes. when you just say this is a problem without mm. any kind of... You and know. the involvement of users. They need yes. to be, the, 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 all the m member mm -hmm. states need to involve users and disabled persons organizations when they select the websites, when they do the testing, when I mean, they are, this involvement piece of the legislation is so important. Definitely. Thank you. Sarah, you've been uh, patiently uh, waiting there and, and um, it's interesting, Sync Leadership, you're UK based, aren't you? But you do a lot of work in the US and Australia. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your organisation? Uh, absolutely, it's been great to hear all, all the panel um, speaking about it. Yes, uh, so just to describe myself, I'm a white middle-aged woman with fair hair hidden behind headphones and my pronouns are she and her for those who, who don't have sight to see me. Um, I co-founded a project, syncleadership.com. About 15 years, I, I co-founded it. And it is a project that's working globally um, across arts, culture, heritage, and media. And if you see our logo, it's got a Y going the other way, which is a sort of kicking Y. And it, it's got attitude. And it's taken from the idea of syncopation with an emphasis on a usually unemphasized beat. And it's about deaf, disabled, neurodiverse and chronically ill leadership across arts and culture. And it's really interesting what Alex was saying earlier in the morning about the Channel 4's disability code of portrayal. This is about disabled people in a disabled led space um, defining how they themselves might be portrayed across societies working globally um, because so often that sense of yes users really important but you know how can we ensure that the users are self-advocating are there right at the start of the process in and around the interrogation of tech and digital inclusion um, so often the disabled experience, as we know, is that we are mentored to death and that we need fixing. And we found with SYNC, having worked, we haven't actually worked in the US, but we've worked um, in the UK, um, across Australia, in South Korea, Singapore and in Canada. And because we're disabled led, we create this sort of safe space to tap into the lived experience where that innovation is be that around digital inclusion, be that in the creation of art with digital in it, or just being an artistic director, a manager, whatever that is. 
And, you know, together in our groups, our intensive groups, and we have sort of also collaborative discussions. At the moment, we're having one between um, SYNC Canada alumni and SYNC Australia alumni, which we're calling SYNC Twilight, because if I'm facilitating it, I'm doing it at midnight in the UK. There's dedication for you, <laughs> but it's so energizing. And, you know, these groups were not just one homogenous group. We have all our intersections and the different lived experiences. So, Irene, what you were saying is really, you know, look to the young users, their mm. mobiles. It's everything. How can we focus on creating the best access there? So, yes, we're working um, internationally, and we we, we sort of kick-started just before we um, uh, were moving towards the four years towards staging the Olympic and Paralympic Games in 2012. And the shock of the pandemic was uh, both delight but a fright because having gone to various countries and worked intimately with people face to face, exploring the relative blocks and barriers and the solutions that we could find together, we pride ourselves on access. And um, without the access, people aren't free to then go into you know, that leadership learning, being coached and not mentored to just break through glass ceilings and be, be you know, active players in decisions that are made about us as disabled people. And the fright of uh, not being able to make that accessible if we were to work virtually, but we managed it. And sometimes in spaces, the platforms that we use, having three different sign languages at one time. So American Sign Language, Quebecois Sign Language, the Canadian Sign Language, and our own British Sign Language, and captioning, and audio description, and all of those things that suddenly we could create an intimacy there. It wasn't the same as being together. Um, that was really profound. And so this global connection, now we feel that SYNC can really have those conversations across the globe. And it's incredibly exciting, this sort of disabled-led entity that is slowly growing. Um, and it means that we can show up in different ways. I, I think the challenge is for us is how we can make hybrid working excellent, because we want to still be together. Yeah, and when that's possible, we can. But a lot of us are still, as we were noting, you know, mid-pandemic still, if we're extremely clinically vulnerable. It means that we can't come out of our spaces. We have to rely on being hybrid, but we want that to be as workable as it's, as it's doing really well here. But so often I've not been unable to attend um, and felt that being online hasn't been as powerful and, and an equitable experience. So for me, it's how we really make that invest in a way that we can all show up be together, be the best that we can be. So I'm really interested in um, digital inclusion, hybridity specifically. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's all about choice, isn't it? And people being mm. able to, as you say, uh, come into a space either virtually or physically and be their authentic selves and, and offer also that representation, you know, which is absolutely key. Certainly, I read um, a statistic recently where there was a, a group of CEOs who'd been um, surveyed about um, whether they were disabled, and 7% had lived experience of disability, but only 1% had discuss that openly with their mm -hmm. staff and you know that representation is so key so that people within organizations or looking into organizations can see that disability should never be a barrier to progressing within organizations and occupying senior positions so sounds like mm -hmm. the work that you're doing is amazing uh, I've just been told we've got about five minutes left so I was just thinking it's been amazing to hear from you all and uh, I guess the last question and, and I'll sort of throw it out there is what do we think we can do um, you know moving forward as a collective and, and a open doors collective for, for other global um, partners to join in what should we be prioritizing to make sure we really are offering each other the best support and um, and community moving forward. Any ideas? Mm -hmm. 
Sarah speaking, can I just come in? I love what Michelle was saying about let's not reinvent the wheels. Let's really discuss and share what's happening, that sense of you know, building on what's successful, what's what works. I think that feels really important. But also putting continuing to put disabled people right at the heart of this, um, rather than just users, really active participants leading yeah. the way from their lived experiences feels really important from my perspective. Absolutely agree. Irene, you were kind of come in. Yeah, I think it's important that we create enabling environments. A good example, legislation is very important, policy. Uh, Kenya is the first country in Africa to um, come up with a digital accessibility standard. Of course, we followed the EN 301-549, and we have to continue making progress at, in terms of enforce, uh, implementation, monitoring, and enforcement, but we also have to think about how we can share the knowledge with other African countries. So in terms of making sure we create an enabling environment so that when we get partners who want to collaborate with us, makes it much easier to implement. So I think that's a very critical piece. Definitely. I would like to, to go back to Shilby because after I spoke, one of the things Shilby said was um, uh, not like uh, what Michal said in, access, in Israel, that we have legislation, etc. Many times in the global community, we see people talking on the stage. We hear countries that are very advanced in accessibility. Um, First of all, it wasn't always like that. Mm. Second of all, on stage we say the best things, okay? <laughs> Let's face it. And part of this global community is also about understanding, and she'll be, I'll be more than happy to um, uh, meet offline and, and, and discuss. Access Israel started when Israel, as I said, was not accessible. We uh, uh, worked on implementation in a, in a surrounding that had no legislation and no enforcement and um, we weren't always successful, but then there were success stories that definitely we can build on and we can see how, uh, um, you know, in India you can take that and how I can learn from your uh, cases and, and deal with, with uh, organizations that still with legislation there yet. So, so I think that uh, it's important to understand that not everything shining is gold and mm -hmm. uh, even if it is gold, it's mixed. And we have our good days, we have our bad days, and the global community should enable, and, and, and I think enable uh, uh, that Irene mentioned is the, the key uh, word here, discussions, sharing, um, uh, really putting it on the table and allowing us to learn from each other. That's so true, definitely. So I don't want to contradict that, but I think we need to talk to others than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. to me, can we stop having those conferences? Because mm -hmm. we are just talking to our, ourselves yeah. all the time. I mean, Sorry, but uh, it's important and, and we love to meet and all of that and we should have, of course share, but what we really need to do, I think, is to make sure that we talk to, to other organizations, to the big tech companies, because emerging technology is now moving so fast and we need to make sure that it becomes accessible and that we can learn from it and don't be afraid of technology, use it instead. And I think just what we can do as a community is to kind of, to bridge the gap between the generalist ICT <laughs> companies, whatever that is, and, and what they are doing and what we are doing as accessibility uh, companies or experts, because that is still a big gap. And if we can do that, then both sides will, will really um, benefit from that. And of course, including involving end users and all, everything everyone else has said is also, I agree to that. But I think kind of looking a little bit outside of yeah. our own little pocket, I think would be useful. And by the way, not just as accessibility panels, in non-accessibility conferences, mm -hmm. but also in being involved in other uh, yeah. uh, ways. Mm -hmm. Baked into yeah. sort of more mainstream, yeah. Yeah. definitely. Exactly. Shilpi, if you've got a final comment, I'm looking at the countdown. Oh, I think we've, lost, you we've lost your audience. Yes. Inclusion, uh, partnerships, new technologies, embedding it into other areas. From everybody because I love what everybody said and I just need to say you know accessibility is truly for all I think we just need to change the messaging um, and stop focusing on you know just visually impaired neurodiverse uh, deaf communities and and really truly make this a community which is global and that people can see the billion people the largest minority needs to stand out 
That's an excellent point to end on. Thank you so much to all of the panel. That's been such an enjoyable conversation and I look forward to taking lots of these ideas forward together. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi everyone.